test will commence in four seconds. Three, two, one, we're underway. When you hit something and that vehicle stops, your body wants to keep going. In the dummies, we have various different types of, of sensors. We have accelerometers, load cells that indicate uh, actual forces, and we have some other sensors that tell us about displacements going on inside the dummies. For the head accelerometers, we're really interested in some of those impacts that cause high G levels that would be indicative of some of the, the trauma that would cause brain injury or other types of head injuries. If we have very good interaction between the dummy's head and the airbag, uh, head Gs tend to be pretty low for a crash. They, they can easily be in the 20, 40, 50 G range. However, once you go beyond the capacity of the airbag, you can hit some hard components within the vehicle. If you have a hard contact with the steering wheel, you can easily get over 100 Gs, 150 Gs. We, in the early development of our side impact program, those Gs were through the roof. They were measuring near certain skull fractures and, and serious brain injuries. According to CDC findings, 17% of all traumatic brain injury in the United States occurs in automotive crashes, second only to the more general category of falls. No field has done more research into preventing head trauma. The technology on display at the Insurance Institute of Highway Safety is the product of decades of development. Inspired by the dummies used in aviation tests during the 50s, the first crash test dummy built specifically for automotive purposes emerged in the mid-1960s. The research's impact, though not instant, was dramatic. 1972 was the bloodiest year in United States history for automobile accidents, with nearly 55,000 people killed. But by 2011, only 32,000 people died in car crashes, a 40% decrease even though U.S. population increased by more than 100 million people over that span. The true value of the crash test dummy is in the ability to quantify the forces associated with each impact. While the science is complex, the philosophy is simple. Reducing the force of impact felt by the body likewise decreases the likelihood of injury to the subject. As the accelerometers that measure such forces became more compact, new applications emerged. A football enterprise first explored at Virginia Tech in 2002 by Drs. Gunnar Brolinson and Stefan Duma. I was attending a conference and I saw a talk about a new type of accelerometer, a new system uh, that a company called Simbex was making. Uh, I grabbed the guy after his talk and I said, you know, this looks great. Uh, let's do this with the Virginia Tech football team. Dr. Duma was one of the first folks that I met on campus and he and I ultimately uh, got together and, and decided that it would be really neat to do a project like this. Uh, back then in 2003, nobody really cared a whole lot about concussions, so uh, we actually had to fund it internally. I'm a very trusting person and I know we got great engineers around here. Our team physician was great, so I trusted them. I, I didn't fully understand it, obviously. I was a little bit concerned how Coach Beamer would uh, perceive it. My initial reaction is anything that we could do that can make the game safer. I trust Dr. Brolinson, and if he was all for it, then I'm all for it. I just uh, trust what he says. The Hokies took the field in 2003 with a modest assortment of eight sensor-equipped helmets, more formally known as the HIT system, which in the seasons that followed would provide data unlike anything previously gathered on a football field. Before this, nobody had ever measured an on-field head acceleration accurately, and nobody even knew how many times players hit their heads. And so it was really an eye-opening experience, that first season of data when we were starting to get position-specific data. Some really interesting patterns developed. You take an offense or defense alignment, they have a mohawk-type pattern of blows. 
um, anywhere from 10 to maybe 40 G's. And if you're an offensive player, or defensive player on the line, you're probably getting hit every play. On the other side of that, we might have a receiver or defensive back that only might get 10 to 15 blows a game, but those blows might be a lot more significant. You know, a car crash where you're going to have a high head impact, that's where you're going to get into the 80, 100, 150 G range. And those are some of the higher percentiles that we see in football. Now that's your top one or two percent. It doesn't happen all the time, uh, but some of those will be in the 80, 100, 125 G range. We've even recorded a few blows in the 200 G range. Those are extremely rare, but they do happen. Three, two, one. About four years ago now, we had a, a call from our equipment group asking which helmet should we buy. Uh, and at that point, we started doing some research and it was fascinating that there was no publicly available data to tell you which helmet is better than the other. That was really what started it was, well, what do we do at Virginia Tech and how do we make a decision to buy a better helmet? Now seven years into their examination of on-field collisions, Dr. Duma and his team, equipped with the head of a crash test dummy, took to the lab and began testing helmets. So you have a head form, you put the helmet on, you have accelerometers in here that measure acceleration. When you put the helmet on, we can test it front, side, top, back, and we can test at all different energy levels. The better helmets will reduce that acceleration and that reduces your risk. This is a, a low level hit. This would be about a 30 G impact. Uh, pull this switch and it drops. A bad helmet might be 60-70, a good helmet might be 30-40. So you really see the quality of the helmet design and how it's able to reduce that acceleration on impact. To quantify helmet performance, the team adopted a rating system very similar to the one used in the auto industry, with five-star helmets providing the most force absorption and one-star helmets the least. Most striking in the initial test was the rating of the Riddell VSR-4, Virginia Tech's primary helmet up to that point. It was alarming. You know, we looked at the VSR-4 as a one-star helmet. You know, one of the worst helmets out there compared to the four and five-star helmets that were available. We also, of course, had all of our on-the-field data. So we had on-the-field data from players that were playing in the VSR-4 helmets, on-the-field data for players that are playing in the Riddell Revolution. You know, in the lab, we saw about a 58 percent reduction uh, in the impact for, a, for the same kind of a blow and on the field it was even more dramatic I think it was about 83 percent. Once we had that information uh, we had to pull all those VSR4 helmets. And what you can see is specifically with the VSR4 which is extremely popular you have a little bit of foam a smaller shell and basically as you increase the amount of foam you increase the stiffness of the shell you get a lot better performance. Uh, Rydell is an interesting study because they had been trying with the NFL to push people out of the VSR4 into the better helmets, but there wasn't that independent data. And so once our study was published, they were able to move almost everybody into their better helmets. And if you look at 2010 versus 2011, there's a dramatic change. The STAR system and these results were able to push the field into changing and getting the better helmets. And I think it's one of the best things we've been able to accomplish. You've gotten that one? Okay. Well, this morning we'll be going through our locker room, getting our helmets set up. We'll be going through, changing our batteries, making sure all of our sensors are working and all of our sensors are communicating with our sideline unit. We have our sensors in there. You can see the, the white and red circles there. So each one of those sensor arrays has six accelerometers that are arranged in a specific uh, setting around the top of the head that fits in the vertex of the helmet as you've seen. And so the uh, information from all six of those accelerometers is then run through a special algorithm that gives us a single tracing for the impact. So we know the direction of the blow and the magnitude of the blow. This is our sideline uh, control unit here. Uh, we have our antenna here, which is relaying all of the information from our batteries and our sensors in each of the players' helmets. And we also have our, our pager, which will notify the athletic trainer uh, whenever a player exceeds that 98 G threshold. All right.
So once the players start going through their drills here pregame, we'll start to pick up any hits that they start registering. On second down for the white team, Rhodey passed out of the backfield to the tight end, Darius Redman. One of our athletes is taking a hit. We got a notification on our pager system. Uh, that athlete took a blow of about 160 Gs, one of the higher ones that, that we've seen. It looks like he took a blow directly on top of the, the crown of his helmet there. And you can see that we got a readout of just under 170 Gs there on that hit. It's given us some good objective data to kind of base the way we manage a concussion, diagnose the concussions, and get them back into play. Um, there's been a lot of times in, in my career here where there's been a blow that, that caused a concussion that we never saw. The athlete didn't say anything about it. We didn't find out about it till later. Hopefully this system keeps that from occurring. While the HIT system prevents the most forceful collisions from going unnoticed, it does not eliminate the need for proper concussion diagnostics. The recipient of the 160G hit documented at the Virginia Tech spring game showed no sign of injury and was soon able to return to the field, a prime example of the quizzical nature of concussion prediction. Why can someone get an 80G impact and pop right back up and be perfectly fine and someone else get an 80G impact, same location, um, to the head and stay down and get hurt? Why are those two athletes different or what's different about the uh, scenario or the situation that caused one athlete to be perfectly fine and the other to be injured. Um, and that's what we don't have an answer to. While North Carolina adopted the HIT system a year after Virginia Tech, they have been trendsetters in many other aspects of concussion research, most notably in diagnosing the effects of concussion on balance. Led by co-directors Dr. Kevin Guskowitz and Dr. Jason Mahalik, the school's Traumatic Brain Injury Research Center anchors the effort to prevent, diagnose, and treat concussions in all sports across campus. Well, a critical piece of the process is that you know, almost all of our football student athletes come in the summer and as a freshman, and that gives us time to take them through the screening. So we're able to establish the baseline, evaluate them, and have that data. And then that way, if something does happen during their time here, we have data to compare their scores to. Okay, so now we're going to be evaluating Rob's balance. I'm going to ask that you look straight in front of you, try and maintain your balance as best you can. Are you ready? Ready. We'll start 20 seconds now. The white square, the, the plate that Rob is standing on, actually has force sensors in them and so we're able to actually capture um, where his center of gravity is resting on this platform. And so over the duration of the 20 seconds, we're trying to track how much movement that center of gravity has. So the, the average 20-year-old score is represented by these gray, gray boxes. Green would simply mean that the patient's score was above the average, red would indicate that their performance was below the average. But what we typically see with athletes is they tend to do better than the average 20-year-old. And in post-injury, we usually see them hovering below. And so we know that they need to kind of get up to where they were. And then when we're done, we get a report that's generated, which we share with our clinical staff. And so we'll look at the specifics of the vestibular system, the visual system, and the somatosensory system, and start to gear some of our potential rehab with those athletes to be specific and cater to what that athlete needs to get better. But the baseline tests are not solely focused on balance. In addition to more conventional cognitive tests, the center also monitors vision. In this one, the athlete is, is simply instructed to strike the green circles as quickly as he or she can. What we've noticed here over the last five or six years is those athletes who don't recover on this typical trajectory, who, who, who take two, three, four weeks or more to recover, um, often complain of some visual issues. So clearly vision plays a role and the eyes have a direct connection to the brain, so it, it makes sense. There's another component to it uh, called Go No Go. And in this one, the athlete is being asked to strike the green circles as they appear, but to ignore the red ones. Their brain is wired to respond to a stimulus on the screen, but now there's a decision-making factor that we're asking the athlete to consider. We're kind of tying in the 
the vision, the eye-hand coordination, to reaction, to response decision making. It's another tool, it's another objective measure in our kind of management toolbox that we use. Though the medical and research teams at North Carolina and Virginia Tech have been investigating the consequences of head impacts for years, public awareness to the issue did not follow along nearly as quickly. But when the pendulum of popular opinion did finally swing, it did so dramatically. Some have predicted head injuries will be the demise of football altogether. Despite their unmatched expertise on the biomechanics of football collisions, those closest to the game are not nearly as alarmist and believe the game is simply evolving to become safer. We need to use science and make decisions on how the game changes, but do it appropriately. Not allow the sensationalized component to change the game dramatically, but use science and use a gradual change to, again, make the game better than it was before, and I think we're doing that. I oftentimes, when I'm giving talks about this, I get asked about, well, should football be banned? Should boxing be banned? Should we be banning these kinds of sports? Well, the simple answer is we're not about trying to ban the sport. We're tr about trying to make the sport safer. If you look at the statistics, the sport that is by far and away the most dangerous sport is bicycling. But it's about two or three times the number of traumatic brain injuries that come in as a result of football. So if we wanted to do something to make sport safer, we'd ban bicycling. Well, that's not practical. So I think that, again, there's a little bit of a hysteria out there right now regarding concussions specifically related to football that I think is, is being overblown. I think that football is, um, regardless of whether the president would allow his son to play, um, football is still a very popular sport and people want to watch it, people want to play it. Um, I think that concussion is an issue. I don't think it's a football issue. Um, it's, it's, you know, more kids, uh, more, more teenagers suffer TBI and motor vehicle accidents than they do in sports. So if you're not going to let your kid play sport, then take the car keys away from him or her because they're probably going to have a higher risk of injury driving a car than they would playing sport. If you look back 30, 40 years ago, we'd have 30 fatalities a year in football. You have 30 people with brain bleeds and they die. Okay, that's changed. The equipment got better. Uh, the, the way they used to play the game has changed. You don't do those things. And we look back like, oh, how did they let them do that? Pick up the quarterback and drop them on their head. You know, that was crazy. But back then they were probably saying, oh, you're killing the game if you don't let us do this. The game's gonna change, but I think it's gonna be a better game and it's gonna continue and it's gonna flourish.